Someone, can someone help me call? Uh, you at the very far back. Okay, hi, um, my name's Sophie, and recently I read this article online that was basically a whole bunch of journalists talking about whether or not they believed journalism was a form of activism, and particularly given the nature of what you cover, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. So that is so great, because that article actually came from Rebecca Schneid, who's the, um, or that, not that article, that debate was started by Rebecca Schneid, who is a high school editor of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas student news magazine, um, The Eagle Eye. And that uh, paper did a collaboration with The Guardian, um, where they assigned us some stories, and we sent them to Washington to cover the march. Um, so that was Rebecca and me on CNN together having this, uh, and I actually did not weigh on that in on that question at all. That was Rebecca and Brian Stelter talking. Um, I mean, I have to say, like, what is activism, right? Like, like in that definition, like, is that, I guess if I'm going to be honest, I will say that, like, I don't think that question is particularly interesting to me or particularly useful. Um, I do, I think Wesley Lowry might have been the one who said, like, well, journalists are activists for truth. And like, there's something there. I think that a lot of journalists tend to be sort of viscerally upset by people lying to them and like viscerally upset by lies. And I feel like that this is a fairly like nonpartisan and acceptable bias for journalists to have. Like, even the language doesn't make any sense. Um, but I also think like what's great about a journalist and why I love being a journalist and not an advocate working for a advocacy group who is part of a distinct industry um, with its own constraints in the way that our activism works, um, is that you can change your mind. Um, you can change as the situation changes very nimbly. And you also don't have to have opinions. And I actually find, for the most part, opinions are super boring um, because the world is really complicated and messy and, also, and often contradictory. And like usually things, opposite things are true at the same time. Um, and that's very hard to deal with. And, and people like, especially in nonfiction stories, like people like simple stories to deliver on a simple moral. Um, and those stories often do really well. Um, your editors like them and your readers like them, but like that's not how the world is. Um, and so like, no, I'm totally uninterested in being an activist. Um, I do think that our job is to be honest, as honest as we can be, and that if um, our readers do believe things that are lies, um, that it is part of our job to point them out and also to think in the ways that we frame stories and choose whose voices to highlight um, to sort of try to work towards accuracy and honesty and giving people a clear idea of the world. I mean, I like try to think of myself as much as possible as like as if a group of you had hired me to like report on the world, and like every day I would come back and tell you what I found, and hopefully I would do that in a super candid way, and um, and you could tell me, and like you would be able to tell, you would be you would be able to see, and it would be a transparent relationship that you could be like push me back and forth, you could get all the sides, and you, if I was campaigning for something that you as my, like, as my hired boss would like know I was campaigning. Or maybe you would be like, listen, I think this is a good campaign, I'm gonna send you out. That's the way I think about it, not as being an activist. Um, in the last, you know, eight months, we've had three horrible mass shootings from Las Vegas to Sutherland to now Parkland. Um, as, you know, journalists, we have to be objective. And as I mentioned earlier at our paper, we have the NRA now on campus. Um, for years, our staff has been very, very older, uh, seniors, juniors, but we actually have a surprising amount of young people, 18, 17, 19 years old, who are just now being pushed to the forefront of this topic. What is your advice to them, as well as us, on how can we be objective in these you know, really tough times of being you know, at this debate, as well as how do we remain objective when we kind of know what is right and what is wrong? So how do you know what is right and what is wrong? Yeah, pretty much. No, 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 but like, but, but um, you say you know what's right and wrong, what is wrong. How do you know that? Well, for, for, like, for what, what I've seen is one thing that my former editor told me is like, you can tweet about CNN, you can, but sometimes you have to tweet out Fox News and that's sometimes, or if you want to tweet about something that Clinton said, you have to also tweet about what Trump said and sometimes what, what words comes out of Richard Spencer's mouth are not the nicest things about, you know, types of people in this country. And it's, how do our reporters pretty much be objective and know what to say? There's a lot of uh, different questions wrapped up in this. Like, one is, like, should you tweet ever? And the answer is, like, probably not. But, <laughs> um, so a couple of different things. Like, one, I think it's a, a great exercise 
for your reporters and for you to always say, okay, here's what I think is true. Like, how do I report against that interest? How do I really dig into the opposing point of view? Um, how would I, you know, prove that this thing I think is false is true? Right? Like, all these are all the skills that you need as a basic reporter, as an investigative reporter. Like, you really need to know how to vet things. Um, and I think. With a gun debate, that's um, really difficult in part because it's incredibly technical, um, uh, and there's, the data is very bad. Purposefully, <coughs> the data has been not produced for political reasons. <coughs> um, but I think it's not that hard to say, like, okay, what would it mean to actually like cover the NRA in a fair way? Like, what are the things that I think are true about the NRA and think are true about its members? And like, let me go and find out if they're actually true. And like. You know, spoiler alert, like some of them are false. Um, not every gun control law in this, in this country like works. Or if you talk to experts, is like a good law that they're like, oh yeah, there's evidence behind that. Like that's not gonna be the case. Um, so I would say like, like report against your interests. Don't tweet. Um, is there something else? I guess like where we are from in South Carolina. Um, a lot of our young, young reporters, they walk around the campus and they see the Confederate flag worn proudly by a lot of people because of where we are located with, you know, Dylan Roof and everything. A lot of these kids, you know, they're 18, they're doing little fluff pieces on local clubs and now they're being asked to report and ask probably some, of, some in some cases on our campus, some of the most mean-spirited people. Um, what do you say to them and how, how can they go about phrasing the questions? so that they're not heavily criticized or uh, just pretty much make me, when, 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 they, when they get the answers, they kind of want to give up. How, you know, how can they not give up? Oh, give up on America? Or, or on journalism itself. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, wow. OK, I'm going to answer. Th I'm, two parts of this. Um, one is um, uh, not, I think y you have to use judgment as an editor to say what issues are issues where it is fair to send a reporter out and be like, challenge your biases, like go and push yourself. You think this is totally false and ridiculous, but like I want you to like try and see, open up, like spend, go shooting with an NRA member, like have them explain their point of view and what you feel about it. Like, um, and then there are some things where it is absolutely inappropriate to do that. And we're like, no, like going to a Nazi and being like, so should there be a white nation? Like that's not appropriate thing for anyone to entertain. Like that, 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 that's a judgment call, right? It's, um, and these, there are definitely people, um, and you know, Nazis are you know, first among them, who will take advantage of this habit of like, let's hear both sides. Um, and like, and there has been like some let's hear both sides from neo-Nazis. Like there have been like people who have written whole articles about like, this man is a white nationalist, but he says he's not a racist. Like, hmm, like, hmm. Um, and this is really not appropriate for reporters. <laughs> like, you know, like, there's, um, so I think, I think that's a judgment call to say um, for what issues and what things is it okay, like for, and, and it's, probably particular to particular reporters, is that like, yeah, this is a good place for you to test yourself and push yourself. But like, no one should be asked to report a story about from someone questioning their own humanity. If they want to do that, that's a different question. But like, you should be thinking as an editor, like, you know, is that good? If, how can I support them? Like, it's a whole different problem. But like, that's just, um, so this is a, like, this is just a judgment call, right? Like, I think objectivity, uh, is difficult because none of us are objective. Um, but I think what people really want from you is fairness and honesty. And those are very different things. And that's not about like tweeting equally from each side or like talking to each side. That's being honest about how much you know and how much you don't and letting people know where you come from. Like I am from Connecticut. I was raised in a house, um, it was not a gun friendly house. I'm from one side of gun culture. Um, but it doesn't take very much to show that you're legitimately interested in someone else's point of view um, and that you're willing to do the research and you're willing to sort of say in print, if there's not evidence behind something, then, then you'll say that. Um, so that's my advice on that. Um, I think I will push the question about like how can you report or deal um, with America for a little bit later in our conversation. Um, I just have like, more of a comment, and I want you to yeah. comment back at me. <laughs> right. um, so this idea of like increasing diversity in the newsroom um, and how that links to, let's say specifically, like the gun control movement, um, I feel like 
<clears throat> it should be less of people like diversifying an environment and those people in the environment like informing others of like hey like these people who are getting killed also matter right like I feel like it should also be like a diversity in thought as well like people in the news like it's not acceptable um, for like <clears throat> a predominantly white newsroom to just be like we don't know because we're white sorry like no like and this is why I think like maybe activism like is potentially like tied into this because if you guys um, like if you guys shed light on or give a space for stories that aren't just about like a mass shooting um, or just like if we're talking about gun the ubiquity of gun violence like in black America like what that looks like that is a way in which like one you're you're an activist but two you tell people that like these lives also matter and that like it's not just like the movement is leaving out this this narrative I really understand the first the second half of that is just can you say a little bit more yeah the second half is that like so, so you made this connection that like the movement in the past has been kind of stagnant and also just like focused on like mass shootings and like white lives. And I'm saying that like I don't think it's, I think that like that's important to recognize but that like that's not necessarily the issue. The issue at hand is that like people and also journalists like don't value black lives and so one they're not being written about and two like they're not included and <laughs> Like, I, I don't know what my conclusion is from that, but that's the second part of like what. So I, saying. I, I, you're saying I think what you're saying is a little bit that what we're talking about is like fundamental values of most of America, and so right. talking about sort of like newsrooms in particular and like small changes might not actually get at that, or is like sort of inappropriate we, to link those two. Yeah, like if we br if, if 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 we talk about newsrooms and diversifying newsrooms, what we're saying is that we want people of like different backgrounds to come in and change the culture or change the thought of the people in the newsroom and that's not their responsibility. That is such an important point. Um, thank you. Um, that's really true and um, obviously um, that is a problem that often happens in newsrooms um, and reporters of color are asked to do free work, free extra work, um, educating colleagues or working to hire other people or doing the work of hiring a diverse newsroom, which is a lot of work and time and money, um, and that is really inappropriate. Um, so I think an important to say that like that's not how things should work. And I think it's also important to say that we don't need a diverse newsroom um, so that black reporters can cover issues that are like relevant to the black community or something. Like That's also something that has been done in the past and is ridiculous. Um, and, or you can see why it happens, and in some cases it might be appropriate, but, um, you know, I think I can just speak to my own experience as, um, as a white reporter um, who has covered these issues and covered racism for a long time. Um, and, like, yeah, like, I, you know, it's my job to educate myself, and, like, also what we're talking about, like, is facts, is, like, is the world out there and wanting to cover the best story out there and wanting to cover the complexity of the world, and any reporter then can do that. Any reporter can cover any story, um, and so I think sometimes newsroom diversity gets twisted into something like that, and I think that's really harmful, um, but I, I do think it matters um, who, I think, looking at the diversity of editors is tremendously important because the people like who's making the calls on what stories get assigned and how they're framed or even how photos are used like it's important to have a mix of people there and I think a lot of newsrooms certainly mine like often work through conversation um, and lots of different kinds of diversity are helpful to say so people can just say mm, I think that's wrong or like Ooh, that headline is bad or like mm, that picture is not good like these small things um, that having uh, a rich and like these small things of people in authority of people making the calls um, will, are really valuable um, and I think that's a, a, you know, a difficult thing, and it often gets sort of explained away into something that it's not. Um, and like, let me say again, like any reporter can cover any story. You might have to work harder at it, um, and probably that's good for you as a reporter. Um, but it's about um, bigger picture questions in the newsroom, and about power and authority, and just about people who are hiring often hire from their own networks. Um, and so having more diverse people in those roles makes it easier to get a newsroom that is truly diverse in so many ways. Um, I think um, 
or like money and class, we were talking about how, um, and be interested to hear from you, like newspapers, who can afford to work for a newspaper in college? Like, is your newsroom actually representative of your student body? Is your newsroom representative of America? Like, who's getting to tell the stories? Um, I mean, like the pipeline of journalists starts in college, and so we were talking about this um, earlier. Um, and I think to your, to your broader question, I think is like um, a really good point. And I think I would maybe rephrase it a little bit differently. Um, but I would say like, like the, the reality is out there. Um, and it is our job as journalists to find it and not to say, oh, this isn't my problem. Like, I'm going to hire someone special who can find out the reality. No, like, it's all of our problem. Um, and I think, uh, in particularly in, in covering violence or in covering race, um, that, um, you know, that this is a story about white Americans, right? Like, racism in America is, like, talked about as a relationship or is talked about race. Like, racism in America exists in the heads of white Americans predominantly, and that um, it's white Americans' progress or decline that determines um, racism in America. And obviously, it's a little bit more complicated than that because lots of different people have racist ideas. Um, I think someone was mentioning, um, you know, an Asian American community making particular decisions about poverty, right? Like, so it's um, always important to acknowledge just how diverse our country is um, and that, like, everybody is problematic. You mentioned how mass shootings only constitute for like a small proportion of gun violence um, deaths in America. And I was wondering, I think people tend to place more value on children's lives because they see people mm -hmm. as innocent, as young, having a whole life ahead of them. How do you bring to forth the numbers while taking into sensitivity that, you know, like children's lives or other people's lives are perhaps seen with, or like people tend to place more value on? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. I will give you a little bit of history. Um, so there's a great um, history, a book, a history of the gun debate called Disarmed by Kristen Goss, um, who's a political scientist. And in it, she looks at the, at the frameworks that gun control advocates use for talking about the, pro the problem of violence. Um, and up until the sort of mid-90s, the framework was a crime framework. Um, and then sort of around, right before and around Columbine, then it became, became a child framework. So that, you know, that this is actually sort of a, a particular political choice and a move to say, if we talk about children and gun violence, that is um, the way to frame this issue. And she actually like counted the number of times like children were mentioned in op-eds about gun control in major newspapers, like very clever and like very distinctive. Um, but what's so striking also about her book is that she looks at Columbine and she looks at the number of teenagers who are being murdered with guns in America you know, before Columbine and after. And, and, and Columbine sort of sparked this national panic about youth violence and school shootings and dangerous teenagers. But if you look at the number of teenagers who were dying, um, it was actually had peaked in the early 90s. Um, hundreds of, of people dying and thousands, I mean, thousands of people dying a year and, and many teenagers. Um, and I was actually on the downward trend. So the moment where there was a sudden panic about youth violence um, was actually a moment where the, like, it was much better than it had been in recent years. But it was continuing to go down. Um, and the moment where the deaths, gun murders of teenagers peaked in America was during the crime wave. But we weren't talking about it as youth violence, right? Like these were black and brown teenagers and black and brown children. And the, that was the idea of the juvenile super predator was brought out. Um, so, you know, which is a long way of saying, like, first of all, like, actually, if you look at just who, the, who, are, who, are, who is dying, and the children who are dying, the children who are dying um, are, again, disproportionately though it sort of depends a little bit on age, um, are minorities. Um, but it's also the question of like who gets to be a child in the United States? Because there's so much research on how um, many people perceive that children of color are already much older than their ages. And um, one of the things that I heard in Oakland from a um, psychologist there who works with victims of trauma, was she was like, there, it's, there's such a dramatic a break that like, the children I worked, the, the sort of black children I work and Latino children I work with in Oakland, until the boys are about like, like 10, 8, 10, like people will still just respond when they hear their shot, like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, like that's so terrible. And then like 11, 12, suddenly it's like that sympathy goes away. So what she was saying is exactly in line with the research that like who even counts to be a child is like racialized in this country. Way back. Yeah, so I'm kind of curious about, um, you're talking about we shouldn't give credence to unreliable narrators in our uh, newspapers, um, but also that 
these unreliable narrators have like really found their way, or have always been in some ways, the, in the political mainstream, and like now quite a few of them have like significant political power and are like affecting the way the country functions. So I'm just curious about how you would consider, like, what would what an ethical way to cover unreliable narrators who like are not white nationalists on the fringes of society, but like people in Congress, um, who you really do have to cover in the newspapers. Well, I mean, the small part of that is like, yes, like if uh, if someone's a member of Congress and they have a lot of power. Um, you do cover them in a way that you might not might make a choice or not a choice to cover like a fringe what openly white nationalist extremist who has like 12 to 50 followers that you can actually see with your own eyes right like those are just very different people um but i think a little bit of, of unpacking what you said um is like one of the things that has frustrated me most about covering openly racist white nationalists and neo-Nazis. Um, although, like, like we said, like, even they will say that they're not racist. They don't hate anybody. They just don't want those certain people to live in their country. But that's not about hate. That's just about something else. Um, and, and also, neo-Nazis hate being called neo-Nazis. They're like, we're national socialists. Neo-Nazi is a slur. Um, but I think. One of the challenges and, and one of the things that I think is problematic about the coverage um, is looking at a campaign and a, a political candidate who was openly racist, had a history of racism, was saying racist things, and saying, like, how do we explain this to people? Um, and that the way that we chose to explain it was to sort of go to these, like, fringe, um, like fringe guys with like five followers and like a really racist podcast and be like, oh, like this person will actually talk about race right out. Like this is how we can we can understand something about racism in America by talking to neo Nazis. And I think actually like you you know these are dangerous and violent groups and they are worthy of coverage. They're probably worthy of consistent coverage rather than just covering them suddenly when the, it seems like they're becoming trendy, which like then makes it seem like they're really surging in membership when it's really not clear to what extent that's true. There has been some growth, how much we don't really know. Um, but it's thinking about like, well, what would it mean to cover like mainstream racism from like nice people who are not like put carrying shields and fighting in the streets, right? What does that look like? Where do we look? What what, what is the danger of American racism look like, and who is, you know, where do you find it? Who's doing it? Um, and is doing it through neo Nazis like the right, an accurate way of capturing how racism works in this country? Um, and it's interesting. Like people will read it. People will definitely click on it. Versus like trying to explain, like Ibram Kendi is an amazing scholar of American racism. He wrote a book. You should all read, or at least read the first couple chapters, called "Stamped from the Beginning: The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America." It's really, really helpful. Um, and you know, he talks about um, how important it is to understand that there are like three kinds of racist ideas in America, or three kinds of ideas about race in America. And one is a segregationist, so this is like openly racist ideas. Um, uh, and the second is anti-racist, so that is like there are no differences between racial groups. Any difference between any racial group as a whole is caused by racism and nothing else. And then there's assimilationist thought, which is like. Mm, and the way he describes it is, um, well, sort of certain people, certain groups, racial groups, like have been discriminated against, but also like they're kind of damaged, or also they've done bad things. And if you look through the, you know, through the thought and through the ideas about racism in America, like a lot actually falls into that third category, including a lot of things that even people like President Obama have said that there's a lot of willingness to be like, well, there's discrimination, but also like these certain people have behaved very badly in a way that sort of we don't acknowledge to what extent that that's like that's a form of racist idea, like that's a racist ideology, um, which is a long way of saying I think it's really important to be precise. I think um, a lot of journalists and. I would include myself in that, like haven't had as much of a grounding in the history of racism in America as we really should. Um, Jelani Cobb, who's a phenomenal New Yorker writer, actually starting a center at Columbia um, for civil rights, um, which involves in its mission making sure that um, we have journalism in America um, that is as informed um, and grounded and accurate about race as we'd expect from journalists who cover politics or economics. Um, so I think there's a real effort to change that. Um, but you know, 
this is a long way of saying like be precise um, and understand that like the ways that people use racist ideas and the ways that people participate in racism are different um, and that like the sort of absurd circus of racism um, that's gotten so much coverage like is not the resegregation of American schools which Nicole Hannah Jones writes about is not residential segregation um, that we talk a lot about these um, you know white neo-Nazi men and their dangerous games. Um, and we don't talk about like white women whose votes are incredibly influential um, and in on criminal justice policy. And white suburban women have been for decades perceived as the swing vote on gun control in America. Um, and gun control has had suffered from what's been politely called an intensity gap, um, which is like white women not turning out all that often when there aren't a lot of mass shootings. Um, I don't think intensity gap is really, I mean, like, we should just say that's racism, right? That's not an intensity gap. So can you just, like, you know, a racism in the mainstream way you're tracking? Earlier, speaking about the, like, the sentence of um, neo Nazis in the media, um, you spoke about a certain hesitancy along the way to call someone racist, like, you know, how do we know? And so then we talk to, like, you know, self-avowed racists. Um, <coughs> can you speak more about the hesitancy to call someone racist and why you might refrain from doing so? I mean, I think it's, I think it's hard because, like, I don't think we sort of in our social lives um, as people have a really clear definition of what it means to be a racist. And I think it's so associated with like being hateful or hating people. Um, and that's why I think Ibram Kendi's work is, has been especially helpful to me because if you can think like, oh, instead of thinking like who is the most hateful or thinking this is a problem of individual hatred, if you think about it as people who might otherwise be very lovely, um, but who do believe things that are false um, and really dangerous and then make decisions and vote on these false beliefs, um, then I think it's a little bit easier to understand um, the, actual pat like the actual ways that racism plays out. Not to say that hatred is not a part of it, um, but the way he talks about um, the way that racism functions um, is that we have this sort of convenient, and this is you know, for more than, more than a century, um, this idea that like racism comes from in ignorance um, and individual hatred, and then it like goes up into like racist uh, policies, um, and then you know that gives us our racist system. And he says like, no, it's actually flipped on its head. Um, that there were times in our in history um, when racist policies were convenient, were economically or socially or culturally valuable, and then in fact very um, wealthy and well connected people at places like. Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard, uh, Cotton Mather, manufactured you know, racist ideas um, in order to justify those racist policies that were, were so profitable and convenient. Um, and then like, those became widely spread. And then, like, then yes, then people, if they believe really horrible things, you know, then that fosters ignorance and hatred. Um, and he says it's really important to sort of reverse this understanding um, because then it's like dealing with racism is not an issue of converting individual people. And also then you can't, sitting in New York City, say, oh, racism is a problem of like, those ignorant people down in the South, which is so false and so unfair. Um, but say, like, oh, no, like, racism is a problem everywhere. And like, New York City is an incredibly segregated place. Like, this isn't some like, other people problem. Like, this is a problem for all of us. Um. First, I want to thank you for the way that you know you talked about your experience um, covering white nationalism groups, um, questioning not only the sources and what they're saying, but the journalists and what they're writing. Um, Re Richard Spencer came to um, UF's campus in October. I followed him. I was there. I was one of the bad journalists. Oh, Jason. So him. if you were there, um, you might have been in the press conference, which I wanted to ask you about. Um, he, you know, did a press conference before he spoke in in front of the public, and of the thirty minutes he was in the room with um, the journalists, ten minutes of that he was berating an NBC reporter for his coverage of. Um, ticket distribution for the event and um, he kind of just like turned the press conference on its head in a way that I'd never seen any source do before and um, this NBC reporter probably had like 30 40 years of journalism experience under his belt and um, Richard Spencer and his um, companions like um, you know the, um, the, the, the people that would interject um, from NPI kind of um, 
we're using the, their rhetoric um, mixed in um, and controlling the press conference in a way that no journalist was allowed to ask a question while Richard Spencer braided this one journalist um, and continually asked him to retract his coverage. Um, I felt like as I was watching it, um, Richard Spencer was doing something right, that he, not that I agree with it, but that he was doing right, right by himself, that he was you know, pushing his message forward and um, not giving a voice to us or any oxygen in the room to anyone else. Um, do you think that Richard Spencer is, um, from your experience with him and others, um, do you think that they're um, thinking about this ahead of time? Do you think that they go into these um, situations with press and um, know how they're going to take the oxygen out of the room? Or do you think that um, this is all spontaneous and they really have no idea what they're doing? Interesting. So I actually wasn't at that press conference. I was trying to interview people outside before. And I was like, I you know, have heard Richard Spencer speak before. I don't need to do it twice in one day. I think it'll be newsworthy enough for the real thing. Um, I can't speculate as to exactly what he plans before and what he doesn't. Um, I will say, you know, this is obviously a person who's been tremendously effective at manipulating the media. Um, you know, in one of these podcasts, he, he talked about, like, you know, well, I used to, like, show up and just be, go to a college classroom, and there would only be a handful of people, and I was glad to do that and talk about these ideas. And, like, now I have thousands of people, and, like, now I'm on CNN, and now, like, Americans know my name. Um, and he did that, like, let's be clear, like, not by building a mass constituency, but by being really attractive to journalists, like, fascinating and, like, easy to work with. And I think one of the clearest signs of... Um, White nationalists will like pick up the phone and they will call you back. They will call you back promptly. And I think that tells you everything you need to know. Like they see the media as a tremendously valuable asset um, and have been like very strategic about that in lots of ways. I think it's also true, um, and Matt Pierce of the Los Angeles Times has written about this really insightfully a number of times, um, that it's not that press coverage is uniformly favorable, right? Like a lot of times um, that coverage of, of like, uh, the Hail Trump has like backfired, um, gotten a lot of pressure. They're, like the movement has splintered under this incredibly negative attention. Um, so I think it's important to understand that it's quite nuanced and like different like things have happened from news coverage at different moments. Um, and it certainly hasn't been a uniform gift. Um, it has put pressure on them. It has fractured the movement and caused it, and you know resulted in divisions. Um, but. You know, I, I, I did speak, one of the first times I spoke with Richard Spencer, I you know, asked him, like, why do you think you've gotten such good media coverage? And he talked about Trump in the moment a little bit. But then he also said, but, like, it's also important to know that, like, I'm very good looking and I'm very um, compelling when I speak um, and I'm very intelligent. And, I mean, this was a phone interview, so, like, my face was like, but I was just like, um, and it was just so striking to me that, like, it's so clear that, like, Richard Spencer was, and whether he still is, has been at moments quite adept at getting the kind of media coverage he wants. But also, like, that was a kind of statement that, like, not a local politician would say something like that. That's not like a clever media manipulator who puts something like that on the record. Um, so I think it is important to understand that it wasn't, to manipulate the media in this sense, wasn't that hard to do. Do we have more time? One more? Um, I just wanted to hear your take on uh, the conversation around masculinity and gun violence and mass shootings. Oh, that is a good one. Um, this speaks a little bit to a story I'm, I'm working on, but I haven't published yet, so I'm thinking about how. So I think the most interesting person who has written on this question, because um, there are a lot of people who are just like, oh, white men, they're, da they're damaged masculinity, and like they're insecure, and they're racist, and they're clinging to their guns. Um, and I... I don't find that analysis particularly helpful. Um, but Jennifer Carlson is a, a Berkeley sociologist, was a Berkeley trained sociologist who, writing her PhD, um, decided to do a project looking at concealed carriers in, in and around Detroit. Um, and so she hung out with a bunch of uh, dudes, um, many of them white, not all, um, who were carrying a concealed weapon with them all the time, um, and just asked them about like why they were doing that, how they had started, and um, what it meant to them to be able to shoot at someone at any moment. Um, and she said that what, you know, she, what she talked about and her framework for understanding what this meant um, was very much about the lack of safety that men felt and the way that they felt like that 
the perfect America of the 1950s had had fractured and was less safe. And and she did talk about the ways in which like maybe they weren't as much the breadwinners, or it didn't mean the same thing to be a breadwinner. And so that they what they really wanted to do with these guns was to protect people and to protect not just their families but their entire communities. And what I thought was really important about that analysis is that you know it says some of the same things as that like sort of sim more simple analysis, um, but it frames it in a different way. And she she wrote, writes that like the carrying of guns for these men like was in a way about caring about other people. It was about wanting to make them safe, wanting to make everybody safer. It wasn't about aggression. It wasn't about being a cowboy. Um, it was about feeling vulnerable in a world, um, and that this was you know, the way you could protect other people. This book is called Citizen Protectors. And I think that's really helpful um, to be able to tr try to comp like make more complex this idea of like what masculinity is. And like I would not have thought sort of going in that, that carrying a gun was a form of caring about other people. Um, but I think she, her work is, is very much in line with conversations I've had when I'm writing similar um, stories or interviewing people, um, that just demonizing people or, or only seeing the like worst part of it um, is not that helpful. And I think it's also like really um, interesting that like guys who are like gun aficionados like will make all kinds of like um, derogatory jokes about other dudes who treat like guns too much like uh, like dicks, right? Like that this is a joke within the community. It's not just like other people being like, uh, it's like a joke there that like that's inappropriate or like you shouldn't be that obsessed with your weapon. Um, so I, long way of saying like, you should really talk to people about that and like talk to men about masculinity and like let's not assume masculinity is so simple. Um, so you're at the five-year mark in covering this, and it seems maybe in the last five weeks that more has changed or seems um, on the precipice of change uh, than maybe in all the weeks before that that you've been on this beat. But I'm wondering if you could kind of look into, sort of gaze into the future. Um, there is this conversation right now about how, how substantive this change may turn out to be or not? Is this just a moment that's kind of a political moment that won't, in the end, have any real lasting impact on how we actually, like the laws and the culture around guns and how we use them and abuse them? If you could sort of look out, you know, five years hence, yeah. what, do you, what do you think this moment will have actually achieved? So there's a, a couple of things from that. Like one, in the short term, everything, like the 2018 midterm elections are all that matters, right? Like if these students are able to show up in a way that makes it appear like they had an impact on the election, like be clear, like it, it, they don't actually have to have it, it just has to be perceived, which is the same thing as the NRA. The NRA was perceived to have a lot more influence um, even on um, uh, elections than, than it might have had. Um, then I think there'll be a, a shift in Congress and a change in laws. Um, and that sort of depends on how much um, these young activists are able to keep the attention of the news media, which they've done well so far. Um, and it sort of it depends a lot on like what, how they show up locally. And you know, one of the underestimated and incredibly powerful tools of the NRA is that they're very annoying. Um, they just show up, and like if you come out against guns, they will just show up in all kinds of ways, in, like letters, in person, in protests. It just makes it unpleasant. Um, and you know, I think uh, the NRA is often criticized, but like probably like showing up and being annoying is actually like a legitimate tool of democracy, right? Like it's like you care a lot, you're going to make this difficult, um, and so I think that's going to be the real um, determinant of impact in 2018 is you know, whether these students are able to strategically show up and be annoying in ways that can make a difference in who gets elected. Um, so I think that sort of for a lot of the measures that we think about, and like, will Congress vote a different way on a law? Um, I think in thinking more differently about um, how much the conversation as a whole will change, or about whether we'll see changes beyond gun laws. I think we're hearing for the for the first time in a really powerful way that like police violence is a kind of gun violence um, and that like we need to grapple with that. And like obviously the kinds of gun control laws that are proposed by um, traditional gun control groups don't 
grapple with that. And then if you look at, at the patterns of um, gun violence in America, the places where gun violence clusters are in neighborhoods and in cities where police don't solve most of the murders. Um, so if you're interested in this topic, one of the most powerful books is Jill Leovi, who's a uh, Los Angeles Times reporter, um, wrote a book called Ghetto Side. Um, and, it, and her argument is that um, a lot of neighborhoods of color are both over-policed and under-protected. The police show up to hassle, but they don't actually solve the murders. They don't provide the actual protection, equal protection of the law. Um, in a way that would be necessary. And I think this is really challenging, and it's challenging for this new movement, and it's and, and really trying to be an intersectional movement and a cooperative movement between a lot of different activists. Because a lot of the Parkland kids are like, government, your responsibility is to help us and protect us. Like, government, you like need to change. Um, but I think if, if you're looking more broadly at gun violence in America, like some of the violence is caused by the government, caused by the state. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a tricky to build a coalition um, where some people are like, government fix the problem, and other people are like, Government is the source of the problem. Like government needs to change in more fundamental ways. Um, but I think one thing that's really important is that, you know, I think maybe before I cover this beat, I might have thought that like people need people's ideas need to change, and then they will like show up to a movement in a different way. And I think actually it sort of it works the opposite way that like people need to show up, and by showing up and meeting people that they didn't expect and having experiences that broaden um, their their lives and their understandings. Um, their ideas change then. And I think I've seen that a lot in the gun violence prevention or gun control movement. I remember speaking to this woman, a white woman from um, the suburbs of Indianapolis, um, who said quite candidly that like, she thought, you know, before Sandy Hook, she thought the only people who got shot were people who were out at 2 a.m. who really shouldn't be out, right? And so that it wasn't just, you know, just wasn't a problem that upset her. Um, even though Indianapolis has one of the cities, uh, the nation's highest murder rates, and it has gone up in recent years. But she said, you know, she showed up after Sandy Hook because of Sandy Hook, because of something that seemed relevant to her and her narrower interests. Um, and there were lots of mothers who were from inner city Indianapolis who showed up there, too, because gun violence was also their issue. And by meeting these mothers, she was like, totally changed her understanding. Because she met this mother, she was like, oh, you know, this this woman's son was shot. And like, he did nothing wrong. She's an amazing mother. and it. Just by showing up, um, she wasn't her intention. Um, she changed politically, and I think that um, I think that happens with a lot of people. Maybe not everyone, but I, I think the fact that these people are showing up together and marching together and beginning to work together—that's um, potentially a way to sort of um, change these ideas and and dismantle the lies that a lot of people believe. So that's the hope I can give you. Thank you.